DAs in Oakland have officially split. We'll hear from some voices at the heart of that situation. Plus, we're talking to leadership at the Detroit Tigers and what the team's rise means on and off the field. And we're hitting all the big MLB topics with a certain former team president. It's Friday, September 27th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. It's our MLB blowout episode. We're capping off the regular season with former Marlins president David Sampson, longtime Bay Area NBC host Brody Brazil, and the president and CEO of Illich Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Detroit Tigers and Red Wings, Ryan Gustafson. Plus, I went to the final A's home game, and you'll hear from some voices from there. First, let's hit the headlines. Former NBA MVP Derrick Rose is retiring from the league after 16 seasons. The youngest MVP in NBA history, Rose made stops in Chicago, New York, Cleveland, Minnesota, Detroit, New York again, finally Memphis, where he played last season. At this time, it seems unlikely that Chicago will sign Rose to a one-day deal so he can retire as a Bull since the team already has 21 players under contract, the maximum that the CBA allows in the offseason. Sticking with the NBA, the Philadelphia 76ers might be staying in the city of brotherly love after all, even as a New Jersey contingent attempts to lure them to Camden. On Wednesday, Philadelphia Mayor Sherelle Parker unveiled a new proposal to keep the 76ers in town through 2061 and reiterated her firm support for a $1.55 billion arena in Center City. The WNBA had a big Wednesday night. Here's what you need to know. Diana Taurasi fouled out with just under three minutes to go in the Phoenix Mercury's Game 2 loss to the Minnesota Lynx, likely marking the end of her legendary career that included three WNBA championships, an MVP award, 11 All-Star appearances, and six Olympic gold medals over 20 seasons. Although she did not make any official announcement about her future, Taurasi skipped press conferences as her teammates and coaches spoke about her impact on the game in what sounded like a send-off. Caitlin Clark's transformative rookie season has officially ended with the Fever losing to the Connecticut Sun on Wednesday night. This year saw a 47% increase in attendance and 170% increase in ESPN viewership. The Fever increased their attendance by 320% since last year. Clark's impact is very real and may just be getting started. But while there is much to celebrate with increased eyes, that comes with issues as well. Following the Fever's loss, center Alyssa Thomas admonished racist comments from the team's own fans, saying, honestly, it's been a lot of nonsense. In my 11-year career, I've never experienced anything like the racial comments from the Indiana Fever fan base. It's uncalled for and something needs to be done. Whether it's them checking their fans or this league checking it, there's no time for it anymore. The league responded with a statement on Twitter saying that, while we welcome a growing fan base, the WNBA will not tolerate racist, derogatory, or threatening comments made about players, teams, and anyone affiliated with the league. Reports came out on Wednesday night that UNLV and Air Force had confirmed that they would be staying in the Mountain West and had already signed. However, FOS College sports reporter Amanda Kristovich has learned that the official agreement, which must be signed by all seven remaining Mountain West schools, has not yet been signed. We'll be tracking this one closely. Jalen Brown finally has a shoe deal for the first time since 2021, and he did it on his own terms. Instead of signing with Adidas or Nike, whom Brown has publicly feuded with on social media, Brown created his own performance brand called 741. Brown's signature shoe, the Rover, will launch on October 22nd with 741 taking pre-orders now. Up next, I went to the last Oakland A's game in Oakland on Thursday and spoke to a handful of fans about their experience of seeing their team depart. Those conversations are next. All right, what's your name? Dante Moses. I'm Jessica. Okay, you work. And I'm Dan. Cal. Uh, Dante, how long have you been an A's fan? About uh, 46 years. Well, this is my Little League hat. Uh, uh, how are you guys feeling heading into the final A's game in Oakland? Pretty sad. Yeah. yeah. Somber. You know, a little bittersweet. I mean, I wish they would stick around, but at the same time, you know, it's the last game. I'm going to support no matter what. It's my own team. Do you think John Fisher legitimately tried at some point to uh, strike a deal in Oakland? I'm sure there are attempts, but... No, no, definitely. What's this do to your baseball fandom? Um, I'm still going to support my team. Uh, maybe go for the Giants now. You know, we won't have the opportunity to go to as many games, and I think it's just a big blow to the community. It sucks for everybody who's been here so long. The loss is something that binds us together. We can bring the crowds out like old times, but it sucks that it took this for it to happen. Ownership kind of sucks. That's a huge disappointment for people of Oakland. I wish my team the best, man. I right, appreciate you chatting. Thank you, man. Have a good one. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Up next, I spoke to Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao at the final Oakland A's game. She came into the negotiations a couple years into them is when she took office. We spoke about what it was like working with the team, if she thinks they were ever serious about staying in Oakland, and what the future of baseball in Oakland and even the A's could be. That conversation's next. All right, Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao, thanks so much for chatting. How are you feeling on this last A's home game? Sad. Yeah. You know, uh, it's am amazing and beautiful to see so many fans, you know, it's sold out. And it's sad in the sense that all of these fans, they're connected to the team, right? They're connected to the game, to the team. And to take that away from them, it, it, it's hurtful, you know? And uh, obviously there's a feeling of uh, disrespect, uh, but it's amazing the energy that is here, you know, where everyone's coming out to say, this is the last game to be played. It's the end of an era, it's sad. But we also say we refuse to be treated like we're in an abusive relationship. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've come back to that relationship metaphor again and again. What do you think it means for Oakland to, you know, be saying goodbye to the A's and look toward a future where we still have the roots, we still we now have the ballers, but, you know, we've, 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 we're losing this major team? You know what? I always say that we're still going to continue to fight. Nothing is sealed and deliver until, you know, shovels hit the ground. And so we know that they're moving, the A's are going to Sacramento to play the minor league stadium with artificial turf. You know, we welcome them to come back and have conversations with us when they are ready. Uh, but however, we're excited for the Oakland Roots to be playing right here in this stadium come next year. And then, of course, we're going to be building out the Malibu site adjacent to this property where that's going to be the home for the Oakland Roots and the Oakland Soul. And um, so it sounds like if you know perhaps there is a new ownership group or maybe fisher has a change of heart uh you would still be open to talking about bringing the team back if things somehow fell through in vegas a hundred percent a hundred percent if we have a strong partner with the city of oakland who really wants to see a project get successfully done then we can make it happen knowing everything you know now and let's say you're just willing to you know, sacrifice things you might not have been willing to sacrifice in reality. Do you think there's anything you could do from the day you took office to keep the A's in town? So that's a really great question because let's be reminded that I uh, have only been in office for uh, you know almost two years, almost two years. So coming in, the conversations around Howard Terminal and the stadium, uh, they were almost complete already, right? Meaning like there was no deal. However, coming in and having that conversation with John Fisher at the very beginning, you know, he assured me that he's still very interested in staying in Oakland. Come to find out, you know, months later when they decided right before we were about to, you know, sign documents that they were going to fully focus 100% on Las Vegas. I mean, it's a waste of public resources. So at the end of the day, I paid, uh, you know, myself and my negotiation teams, we were fully immersed in making sure that we can come together and negotiate a deal. And that is time and money from, you know, taxpayers' uh, dollars, right, that could be spent somewhere else. And so it's disappointing, but uh, in hindsight, you know, the deal was already done for them. Uh, and only they knew about that, and that was they were moving to Las Vegas. MLB was pushing the A's to try and stay in Oakland, but they kind of had one foot out the door for a while. Does that check out with your experience? Oh, absolutely. For over 10 years, they've been you know, one foot out the door. Let's recall that they tried moving to Fremont, uh, into the South Bay. That couldn't happen because of marketing shares. And then so, you know, it was always a feeling of like trying to figure out how they were going to leave Oakland and, um, and you know, how they were going to get the okay from MLB to leave Oakland. And so, you know, it's, it's unfair. And any final thoughts on this whole saga as we hear a sell the team chant in the background? Yes, I, I, I agree with the with the fans, sell the team. <laughs> it's the community that really buys into the team. And so therefore the teams are rooted in the community, you know, and I'm hopeful that this is the beginning of a cultural shift in regards to how we uh, work with uh, professional sports in the, in the nation. Mayor Tao, thanks so much for taking the time. Yes, thank you for having me. This long chapter of the Oakland A's saga is coming to an end, but it really has been a saga. NBC Sports host Brody Brazil has lived through this and chronicled it as much as anyone. He joined me for a look at the past, present, and future of this team in sports in Oakland. Our conversation is next. Very excited to be joined now by longtime NBC studio sports host for the Oakland A's and San Jose Sharks, Brody Brazil. Welcome, Brody. Oh, and I appreciate it. Um, I've watched a lot of your work, and as much as I don't want to be here for the situation of why I'm here... <laughs> be talking with you like this yeah likewise um so yeah let's the situation obviously is the oakland days are in their final days 
as the Oakland A's as a, and they've got their last game in Oakland coming up. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to even know where to start here, but just where are you at emotionally at this point with this team? I'm like an abstract painting uh, because one day I wake up feeling ready to move on. Let's just get this final day over with. Um, I wake up other days and I'm not ready for it to happen. I wake up some days frustrated, angry, sentimental, emotional, uh, you name it. And then developments keep happening that don't make it any easier uh, along the way. Like we've known this state, we've known this schedule, we've known kind of the writing on the wall, but I think approaching it brings a whole different range of emotions that you couldn't have even planned for. So kind of going through something that no sports fan or broadcaster is designed to ever go through in baseball. This has happened once in the last 50 plus years. So it's interesting. It's, I, I told somebody the other day, I never thought I would sign up for like this part of the job. Like we're not even covering baseball anymore. We're covering kind of a historic uh, part of Oakland history, Bay area history and major league baseball history. So to answer your question is as easy as I can. I'm just all over the place in five minutes. And by the end of our chat here, I might even be feeling differently then. No, I mean, part of me will be relieved when it's over just because we've known the end is coming for a little while now. And and yeah, so there's there's part of me that's like, you know, when when this is out of the way, that'll feel that'll there'll be a burden lifted. At the same time, I can like even just talking about it now, I can feel myself like kind of getting upset about it again. Yeah. And there's just this feeling of like, it didn't have to be this way. It's not like, you know, Oakland and baseball just could never work. Like, obviously it, it works great. <laughs> like when, when it's allowed to work. Um, and I mean, for you, do you, cause I, over the years, you know, sometimes I've been more on the, like, you know, Oakland could really like step up a little more or like, you know, like different, different forces, different factors, <clears throat> different negotiating partners that I've um, put some amount of blame on it's kind of consolidated all on john fisher for me the a's owner um where are you at in in terms of the blame game we can talk about 15 16 20 years of five different stadium sites and propositions and we can talk about all that stuff for, for me the last thing that happened for the a's in oakland and the push to howard terminal and there was a, a mayoral change even through that process from Libby Schaap to Shang Tao. Look, Oakland, I will be very upfront about this. Oakland was not the perfect, ideal turnkey partner to work with. That has to be established. It, it wasn't easy, but on the same note, uh, a city municipality going through as much struggles as it is, it's not supposed to be easy. Like there is supposed to be like nothing worthwhile in life is supposed to be easy personally or collectively. So I think the the point though is that if we're judging by the last thing that was on the table here and Howard Terminal and the approvals that happened from an environmental impact report and approval of the BCDC, which is the governing body of any kind of development on the San Francisco Bay, they all approved it. Everything was lined up and ready to go and it was just left on the table and nobody has really come forward with a resolution to exactly say why this was left sitting there and all the hard parts. If you told me, hey, you know what? The EIR came out and you just can't build a ballpark there. Or all the lawsuits that were up against the project and, and the city and the team and trying to get this done, all those things were defeated. And so what was the part that couldn't get done? So again, we can go back in history. Um, you know, it's like a baseball game itself. We can talk about innings one through eight, but if this game was decided in the bottom of the ninth, I mean, honestly, that is the ter turning point. That's the deciding factor of the baseball game, the very end. So that's kind of how I feel. And until I ever get that that question answered, uh, it's hard to understand, wrap your brain around like why this couldn't happen and what Oakland did in, in procuring $600 million of state and federal funds for infrastructure. Like all these things were there and on the table. And at that point, at that crazy point, when the A's had never pushed as hard, when the city had never pushed as hard, that's when the team decided to walk away in April of 23 officially. And that, that is what you just kind of laid out there at the end. That is kind of where I end up back with John Fisher because, yeah, it would be one thing if the environmental impact report didn't didn't work out or, um, yeah, they didn't they didn't get approval for the site, which I mean, they, they chose a site where they needed a lot to go right. That was pretty much out of the A's control and it pretty much did go right um, to get to that point And for the team to say, actually, you know what? Time's up. We're going to Vegas. And then the first site in Vegas, they actually they then pivot immediately from that. And it's like, um, 
I mean, I've sort of the metaphor of the breakup has like, you know, been with me for for a lot of this. Um, and yeah, for a while, it's like, oh, whose fault is it? And then sometimes when when the breakup actually happens, you're like, oh, wait, Oakland actually kind of has its act together here. The A's right now don't. Um, even their efforts in Vegas, I feel like, have kind of shown that they're they're not this buttoned up organization that has had their ducks in a row, to mix metaphors. Um because we're seeing kind of the same the same act playing out in a different place. Um, and I think what they were looking for was basically the Vegas treatment where, I mean, there was there were some tough negotiations or, um, in Vegas, but basically they got what they wanted very quickly. It took, you know, like a month or something for them to go right. from we're building, we're, we're coming to here's your money. Um, and well, and, and the free, the free land at the site of the Tropicana right. and, and to have yeah. your, to your point, not a first deal a binding deal that was apparently not binding to a totally <laughs> separate deal and the money in the free land and, and basically all the approvals. No, you're right. It, it happened very quickly down there. Yeah. How has all this changed how you view MLB and maybe sports generally? That's a fair question uh, because I think if you ask that to most fans, you know, they, they operate on their heart, right? And they wear it on their sleeve. For me, I'm somebody who's already been working in the sports ecosystem for 25 years. So, uh, oh, and I'm not going to tell you that I've been jaded for decades, but I've been already jaded for decades. I understand it's a business. And even when fans can't see like why ownership groups would do this or that, and I'm not talking, I'm taking us out of this conversation right now, the A's thing. I'm, I'm saying like why sports teams and their owners make decisions. Sometimes you really have to view it from either their perspective or what they're trying to do or the bigger picture. So my point is I've already got a, a, a jaded view and a distorted view. That's probably the better way to put it on, on sports teams. You know, I, I, it, I think the unfortunate part for me with major league baseball, um, I've got a lot of different feelings. If I could simplify it into one thing, it was the fact that they unanimously approved the A's departing Oakland and going to Las Vegas. And at the time they did it. Now, since then, the A's have moved forward on some developments. We finally have a kind of final rendering. And apparently there were blueprints to some degree presented in the last two weeks uh, at a conference at the Rio Hotel. My point is, but when the decision, when baseball and its 30 owners got together November 16th of 2023, they approved this unanimously. When in life in 2024, you tell me when, 30 owners, 30, 30 rich entities walk into the same room and unanimously agree on anything. And I'm talking about uh, politics, business, finance, uh, sports teams, elite. No, 30 people don't agree on anything, but they unanimously agreed on this and not just this, but without all of the actual details they would need to understand and comprehend. Like, is this a good idea? And is, should this be moving forward? And to your point earlier, are all the ducks uh, in a row here? So. I think my my role in all of this and throughout the last year and a half, two years, is really just been, been to ask a lot of questions. And um, if those questions are answered, then those questions are answered and I'm done. But until all those questions are answered, number one, we don't have some finality of this thing moving forward. Uh, and number two, I, those questions still exist for me. Um, and I know the Tropicana Hotel is going to be demolished within the next a week or two weeks, like it's it's coming down with an implosion. All that stuff was going to happen anyway. I mean, the big thing at this point that matters is unless there's groundbreaking at that site, which still has a lot of questions between Bally's and the nine acre thing, I mean, it's just a lot. But unless there's actual tangible movement on that site in the second quarter of 2025, there's just a lot more red flags that that come out of the woodwork. And yeah, I mean, I, obviously we've got a whole lot more questions and answers at this point. Is there, do, do you have any kind of like take on what's actually going to happen? Like, cause, I mean, a lot of people think they're just going to get stuck in Sacramento or at least like the Bally side is going to fall through, but then they lose their state funding. Right. right. Um, or or the, do you think that they'll just kind of muddle through and eventually get their stadium where they say it's going to be? I think, and there's, there's a little bit of precedent in this with what the Arizona Coyotes just went through, uh, spending what they thought was going to be three years at Mullet Arena on the campus of ASU, 4,500 seat arena. They had a perfectly usable building out in Glendale and apparently Glendale wanted a long lease and the Coyotes didn't. And so they got kicked out, evicted, whatever you want to call it. Couldn't agree on Glendale. 
So they do this temporary thing, and about a year into it, the NHL and its players are like, you know what, this seemed like a good idea. Two things, it's not a great idea. And the second thing is they were having complications on not one, but two different sites, the Coyotes were, to try and get their new arena built. And so the NHL, at the same time, and I'm mentioning all this because Utah is going to play a factor here. Utah, back in February, approves $900 million twice once for for the Delta Center and its surrounding neighborhood to be improved. The other one is nine hundred separate million dollars for a major league baseball stadium around the State Fair Park, uh, right on the Jordan River there. So, so my point is, NHL went down there. Gary Bettman and Bill Daly fly in and tell Alex Marillo, um, it's over. Like we've given you time. Everybody's complaining. This isn't working. We got to get you out of here now. I don't know about the A's situation. I'm saying the parallels, it's it's an uncanny parallel of of what we're venturing into here with Sacramento. And maybe there are no hiccups. Maybe Las Vegas, the groundbreaking starts, and maybe Sacramento is just that temporary destination. I know a lot of people are pointing out the viability of Sacramento, both good and bad, saying good if they could build a stadium, but bad because of a lot of reasons that that are complications to their next several seasons. But I'm going to throw the wrench here in kind of the engine and say that what if Utah presents itself? Like if there are any challenges and says, Hey, you know, Las Vegas is an issue. Sacramento is an issue. We don't think you're going back to Oakland. Here we are with $900 million. And look, Utah was trying to court the A's for their temporary seasons back in January and February. They had the billboards all up. So I'm here to say that although we think we know like, okay, it's either going to be option A or B, uh, I'll throw option U out there as in Utah, because I don't think that one's as far off the radar as people might expect. Yeah, I think that's right. Especially if like the hockey team, you know, just has a great, you know, first couple of seasons and they're like, you know, like, look, like we've, we've got the funding, we've got, you know, we've got your stadium, we've got the the Larry H. Miller group, which was the former owners of the jazz. They sold it to the Smith entertainment group. They've got apparently $3 billion to pump into this project. So, I mean, they've more than anyone else is waving around right now. I mean, the, the, the chemistry to get a major league baseball team, whether it's expansion or relocation is the land. Uh, the ownership group that's got a ton of money and some sort of public funding. It's kind of an unwritten requirement of Major League Baseball that, you know, hey, you got to chip in. So we're not going to pay for all of this. And you know what? They've got all of that already checked off. So. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the, the ownership group obviously is, you know, of course, it's a part of it. But that's why um, that's why Utah got an NHL team. It's not like they had to go to Utah and nowhere else. Um, right. Brian Smith was just kind of ready to go and send, you know, mm-hmm. like I've already, you know, I've already established a relationship with the league. And do you remember when he said, you know, he was after initially the expansion franchise, but it was like the expansion franchise, wink, 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 nod, nod. And knowing that the coyotes were in dire straits again, it kind of feels like, and you know what, here's a side note as the A's are set to depart Oakland, it kind of makes me turning back to Oakland feel, I wonder if Oakland should be a savage type city and start you know, p- pumping out threats or, or options for like the Chicago White Sox. Oh, you want the new ballpark at the 78? Oh, that's not going to work. Oh, we have a waterfront ballpark. Chicago White Sox move out to the Bay Area or Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh, Chase Field, the roof can't open and shut. You got HVAC issues. Come up here where the climate's perfect. So I, like Oakland has yet to play any offense on this, but it kind of make me wonder if they want to emerge as an actual player to try and get something back. Yeah, I mean that that would be pretty interesting and you know pretty quite wild. a role reversal. Yeah. <laughs> um but you know at at this point why not? I mean they've been playing defense and you know it's been kind of this sad story of like you know the Raiders leave, the Warriors go across the bay and go that far. They went less far than the Niners actually. Yep. But um but yeah, and obviously the A's um and there is this like asymmetric thing sometimes with relocation or the threat of relocation where the city that's keeping the team is like yeah, obviously we want to keep you around, but like, we're not just going to like necessarily give you half a billion dollars just to spruce up your place. Like you're a private business. Like, come on, like let's work together. Whereas a place that doesn't have a team, it's like, Oh, we could go from no team to yes team. Like, yeah, that's worth. Yeah. Half a billion, 900 million, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, and I think the reason those 30 owners said, yes like let's let's not cause any fuss here is they at least want that threat and maybe some of them want to actually move but they don't want to make it seem like this was a just a bad idea to your point even if utah or portland if they do or don't ever get a team 
the fact that they exist and the fact that they are an option and the fact that they are putting themselves out there and showing you renderings and showing you, they'll be a factor in all this stuff, right? So yeah. again, even if the A's don't, um, aren't enticed by Utah, maybe the Diamondbacks are, maybe the White Sox are. Um, Orlando kind of pitched itself within the last uh, 12 right. months to try, the, the Orlando Dreamers to try and get the Tampa Bay Rays maybe to move. I mean, they said, oh, we'll do expansion, but oh, that's three teams in Florida within like a, you know, yeah, you're not really allowed to say like we're poaching that team. You can, yeah, you know, you no, can we're, like, we're, it's like we're that. here. Like, what are you really here for? You know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so no, I, to your point, anybody who puts themselves out there as a as a city with with a group that wants baseball, uh, they're they're at the very least they're going to impact the process and decision making. Yeah. And, and that is the, the world we live in. That's, that's the, you know, the, it's a business side that I think kind of crosses the line for me of like, this isn't just like, oh, your favorite player got traded. It's like the, the whole team up and left because, and we just say it's a business, but, um, but this is the part that feels wrong to me where I'm like, um, you know, this, this should be more than a business because people like this is the, they've helped their whole identity is the Oakland days. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've I've uh, come across a sports fan who's upset that their football team lost a game to the Rams this weekend or their baseball team, um, you know, got Blake Snell back. And, you know, it's I don't mean to make this about age giants, but, you know, around here, there there are cries about this and that as there should be. Those those are the things that sports fans should be passionate and upset and happy and frustrated about all the above. But like to your point, losing a team versus losing a game or losing your favorite player off the team. And there is no comparison to the loss of a franchise. And as we start to realize here, the history and traditions and sentimental aspects and the generational aspect, I, I have a son, I can't pass this down to him now. Um, and it, it wasn't supposed to happen like this. So to your point, I think it's not it. It's almost like when somebody comes across you and you're complaining about something that's minor and tedious, and then they remind you what's what's important in life. This is kind of what's one of those what's important in sports conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Brody Brazil, let's do this again absolutely. when there's happier news to talk about. <laughs> um, thanks so much for joining us on the show. You do a great job. I can't wait uh, to see who you talk to next. The Detroit Tigers are back after seven consecutive losing seasons. The team has emerged this year and currently holds one of the final wildcard spots in the American League. I spoke to Ryan Gustafson, president and CEO of Illich Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Tigers and Red Wings, on what this year has meant for the team both on and off the field. Here's our conversation. I'm joined now by Ryan Gustafson, president and CEO of Illich Sports and Entertainment. Welcome, Ryan. Hi, Owen. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So the Detroit Tigers, you know, they've got their first winning season in eight years and are currently holding one of the wildcard spots in the American League. Other than the standings, how have you felt the impact of the team's success? I mean, it's been an incredible few weeks, so we're really excited about the direction of the team, and, and so are our fans. Um, it's been that way all season. You know, we've had uh, double-digit attendance growth over, over last year and certainly been amplified the last few weeks as our team made the run, but we're building something really special here in Detroit and um, certainly uh, are excited for what the future will hold. What does it mean for your ability to you know, sell sponsorships and we can get into the media end of it too, but um, how much does it matter if, you know, you go from say, you know, like 1.6 million to 2 million fans um, showing up at the gate? I mean, uh, the, the entire boat lifts a little bit when you have uh, more people in the building, for sure. Our job is to make sure that we're maximizing the window of time when the team performs well and, and, and supporting the team when we've had some down years uh, on the flip side of that. So it's nice to, to be in a window on both sides of the street, Tigers and Red Wings, where we feel like the team's going to be really competitive the next few years. Um, and our team's excited to maximize that. And you know, from a baseball perspective, now is now is the time to buy. I mean, you know, obviously you're still focused on the playoffs for the moment, but a lot of um, enticing free agents this off season, and you know you've got a good young team. You know, one would think this is the time to you know put some some free agents um, around that core. Uh, what is how do you kind of balance you know that desire to to fill out this team with you know the best players you can get with you know you still you have to run a business here and, you know, not get too far over your skis. What's the calculation there? Well, we have an incredible baseball operations leadership group. Uh, Scott Harris, president of baseball, Jeff Greenberg, our GM, AJ Hinch, our manager. 
and, and so many others. Um, and they've built a, you know, a great vision to create a sustainable winner here. Our job is to support them with all the resources and support they need in order to continue building a championship culture. So I'm not sure what this offseason will entail. We have a, an incredible group of young talent and we're going to be ready to uh, be opportunistic on um, anything that's out in the market and continue to get better every day. Um, but I, I trust in those guys, um, you know, and, and just really, really looking forward to um, what the next few years holds there. And in terms of how, you know, the, the baseball operations and the business operations interact with each other, is there any sense of you can spend money to make money as in, you know, you can, if you sign like a, you know, Pete Alonso, Juan Soto, you know, who might be, He's going to be in rare territory. But anyway, if you if you get some some big names on your team, um, you can you get some of that back. Yeah, it's to a certain extent. But, you know, the way we look at it and, and um, myself and my team are very close to our baseball operations leadership is their jobs to create a winning competitive team consistently. And we're going to support them, whatever they decide to do. Um, obviously, if they decide to sign a big name free agent, we're going to maximize that opportunity. But. Um, independent of that, you know, our job is just to, to, you know, sell and market this really exciting young team and um, support the, the baseball operation in any way we can to, to create a championship team here in Detroit. Just to zoom out a little bit, I'm curious like, what you see as the big categories of, of revenue for a baseball team. Obviously, you know, ticket sales is one, local media is another, sponsorships, I'd imagine, is a third. Um, or is there a rise it or other things you'd throw in there? Yeah, I mean, you hit on the big three, of course, um, but all the ancillary revenues related to hosting games um, and attendance obviously will impact those um, non-baseball related events. Um, we have a, a joint venture at Ellis Sports Entertainment with the Pistons um, where we have six venues and um, host, you know, hundreds of events every year. So that is a really large part of our ecosystem. Um, and I know a lot of other baseball clubs uh, do whatever they can to monetize the off days at the ballpark. Um, and we do the same thing at all of our venues. And are there certain ingredients to the Detroit market that, you know, you, you would see in other markets too, of course, um, that you that you kind of rely on and look for as you kind of evaluate the market? Um, Detroit's unique from the standpoint of the, the fans here. Um, this is the case in a lot of markets, but more so here than what I've experienced. The sports teams are such a part of their identity. And if you think about the brands, the old English D, the winged wheel, like those are truly iconic brands that are representative of this city. People wear the old English D, they have a tattooed on them. It's just an incredible um, brand that represents not just the team, but the city as a whole. And um, the fans here are very resilient. Um, it's a gritty market um, that just rallies around these teams like um, I haven't seen in many places. And so, you know, win or lose and tough years and, and, and great years, uh, fans show up, they support the teams, and it's just part of the culture here. Yeah, and even more broadly, um, you know, I mean, baseball, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's bread and butter is that it's ancient, you know, it's, it's over a century old, MLB is over a century old. Um, at the same time, we're, we're starting to, you know, the game's evolving on the field in some ways. How do you see um, baseball evolving in the business side? Well, baseball has this unique um, platform where there are so many games and it's such a great opportunity to engage a wide range of, of people. We have 162 games a year and 81 home games. That's 81 chances to create memories and to um, do something special. And the great thing about baseball is you can come to the ballpark on any night and see something that you've never seen before. And you have players like Shohei Otani, um, Juan Soto, Aaron Judge, that are just like incredible to watch. Um, and so many young players that are coming into the game as well. So I, I think baseball is always going to hold a special place in my heart. And I know fans as well, just because it is such a beautiful game and it's something that's on every day. And there's a rhythm to it that makes it exciting. And, and like I said, you, you just never know what you're going to see when you come out to the ballpark. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Good luck on the rest of the year. And Ryan Gustafson, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Appreciate it. Go Tigers. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. 
each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. David Sampson is the former president of the Miami Marlins, and he says things that most people are not willing to when it comes to the business side of how baseball really operates. We spoke about a number of MLB topics, including the historically bad Chicago White Sox, the bad press the Pittsburgh Pirates got for saving $200,000, and why sometimes the announced attendance at a game is a much higher number than what it seems like just from looking at the crowd. That's coming up next. I'm joined now by David Sampson, host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson and uh, MLB analyst for CBS Sports. Welcome back, David. How you doing? It's been a minute. Happy to be back with you. Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah. How you been? I'm well. It's my favorite time of year. We are uh, approaching October and the playoffs are in sight at the end of this long grind of a season. And this year to me is completely up in the air. I think it's as hard to predict this year as it turned out to be last year when it was Arizona and Texas. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure no one had that when October started. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone had that like, you know, on October, you know, whatever it was 10th. <laughs> like, I don't think anyone had that going into the division series. Um, all right. So uh, let's, let's start with the White Sox who will not be in the playoffs this year. Um, they are having, you know, it depends on who you ask, but the worst season basically in the modern era, which in MLB terms, for some reason means you played after the 19th century. If you were diagnosing this patient, where do you start? I'm sorry, before we start that, I'm just curious. So are there people you spoke to who said they're not the worst team of all time? I'm just leaving some room for, uh, you know, whoever's actually saying, well, actually, it was the 1937 whoever's, you know. I would like to congratulate them. I would tell you that inside baseball, we would always say it's as hard to lose 120 games as it is to win 120 games. So the fact of the matter is they're just in the horseshoe theory of baseball. They're right at the tip, right near the best teams in the history of baseball. It's been quite a feat just losing this number of games and make no mistake. This is a record that is really hard to break. And I think the only certainty that I can tell you when you go into this off season for the White Sox, no matter what they do, no matter where their payroll goes, no matter who they fire, hire, sign or don't sign, they will not lose over 120 games next year. Right. I mean, it takes some some amount of luck. Though the same way it gets it does to win 120 exactly. games. Like everything has to go wrong or you know go right in the other scenario. Um, if you were you know figuring out kind of where to start with making this a respectable franchise again, where do you start? I mean, let, let's be honest. There, if if this were tanking. And let's pretend that it's the Astros who lost over 100 games three years in a row or the Cubs who did it as they rebuilt toward their world championship in 2016. The Orioles who were terrible and then got good. Why can't it be that this is the White Sox who are just trying to get good and will have two or three years of bad performance? And the answer is because there's no plan in Chicago the way there was in Houston in Chicago for the Cubs. And all the White Sox had to do was look a little bit north and they would see, all right, we can be really bad. And then we'll sprinkle in an Edwin Jackson to make people pretend that it's going faster. And then we'll get to winning. The thing is, when the White Sox look at their team, I'm not sure they have any keepers on their team other than the pitcher who's had a good year crochet, who was wanted at the deadline, but said, no, I'll not pitch out of the bullpen and you better extend me or else I won't even play in October for you, which no matter what anyone says, that had a question impact on his value. The fact is that you've got him as a piece that you could move unless you think you're going to be good before he reaches arbitration, which seems unlikely. So I would move him. So my view is that whether it's Chris Getz or not, and the reason Chris Getz was hired is that Reinsdorf said he knows the organization. So this will be a faster rebuild than if we hired someone from the outside, which of course is total horse hockey. But given all of that, I would say they start completely over and next year start the three year. We're going to stink for three years. We're going to 
attract a ton of young players and we're just going to try to draft properly and be Houston or the Cubs. The problem is I'm not sure Reinsdorf would ever allow it. And, you know, there there are also those teams that try to be bad for a while and just end up kind of staying bad or like they don't, you know, get good. They just get mediocre. Oh, and it's hard. It's very hard. You know, we talk about Houston and, and the dynasty they're in now and, and the losing that, that preceded it and Baltimore, et cetera. There are way more teams that have windows. I was the president of a team that kept opening windows. We'd be okay, and then we'd have to close the window because the players got too expensive, and then we'd stink and rebuild and then try to open another window. So you're really trying to figure out how to maximize your open windows when you are a team that's not the Yankees or Dodgers, and it's not as easy as you think. Let's get to another couple teams that um, that seem to be opening that window, and then it's like a you know gust of wind came by and it it blew shut again. Um, let's start with the Pirates who cut Rowdy Telez, their DH, who was having a very good second half of the year, four plate appearances before he would trigger a two hundred thousand dollar bonus. Hold they claim on, Owen, I'm not. I'm pushing back on you. Take a look at his September. He stinks. The fact of the matter is that they should they should have cut him two weeks ago. Why they would wait until he's four plate appearances away from making 200 grand, which ruins the optics and opens yourself up to a grievance, is malpractice by that front office. The fact that they don't want to pay him the 200 grand, that's actually smart business. It has nothing to do with a penurious owner. It has nothing to do with the fact that the team loses or he's unpopular. That is just good business and Here's a little nugget for you. There are 30 teams who pay attention to incentive clauses in contracts. There are 30 teams who pay attention to when those levels are hit and 30 teams who make decisions on an ongoing basis, which players they are okay having hit the incentives and which players they're going to designate or trade before they have the chance to hit those incentives. So, yeah, I just checked. You're correct. He did stink in September. Let me ask you this, though. If you know, the, the Pirates need the Rowdy Telezes of the world to try to, you know, patch together a, a roster. Are they not sending a message to a whole bunch of potential free agents who might be looking at an incentive laden deal? Um, if things aren't going well for the team, we're just going to find a way to get rid of you uh, so you don't hit those incentives. Every player I've signed with incentives in the contract, we've talked after the contract is signed and the players said, hey, you going to let me hit that? You're going to let me hit that? Everyone's aware of it. And uh, both sides are, including the agent and the front office. And in terms of future free agents, at, when you say that every team needs a player like that, you're right. And those are the players you sign to, uh, you give them a major league invite to spring training, give them a couple million bucks if they make the team. And sometimes it's a one-year $8 million deal or a Craig Kimbrell one year, $12 million deal. And once he starts being bad, you designate him. This happens all across baseball every single year. So yeah, you need players like that. But the majority of the signings that you do like that don't work out. Some of them do. And you just have to be nimble enough and smart enough when it's not working out to not open yourself up to this level of criticism. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, they're getting people like me to say like, hey, what's going on here? Another thing that I want to, I was curious to get your take on this because I can't tell if this is normal or there's something weird about this. Um, it seems to happen a lot. The Reds fired David Bell with a week left in the season, their manager. Um, and they said it was just so like they've already, they've got everyone together in the same place. They can talk about the future. Um, at the same time, it felt like why not just, you know, let him manage the last few games and call it a day. My guess is they gave him the opportunity if he wanted to manage the last few games. Uh, when we got rid of managers at end of seasons, we would allow that uh, sometimes. There's other times where you tell the manager you're moving on and they just pack their bags and go home. But the reason why you do it before the last game of the season is at the end of the season, players and coaches and managers disappear. Their bags are packed. They're leaving on a jet plane going full John Denver minus the plane crash right after, hopefully, right after the season ends. So you really don't meet with your coaching staff and managers that day. If you're making changes on the staff, you do it in advance. And if you end the season on the road, we were always on the road with the team anyway. So we would do our meetings during the last two series, during the last road trip. We'd rather be at home so we can have the meetings at home. 
but if you don't want to go on the road, then you do have the meetings when you're at home and it's the last week. And you also want to give the other coaches a chance when you're not bringing them back to look for other jobs, to put their names in the hat for other coaching positions because teams start filling up coaching positions almost immediately after the season ends. Let's head over to the West. I actually want to start with the Padres. So um, they're, they've hit 3 million in attendance this year. They did that last year, almost got there the year before. If you look at pre-pandemic, they're just kind of middle of the pack. And now they're consistently in you know one of the best attended teams. Um, they got there in part by signing Manny Machado, Fernando Tassis Jr. And you're trading for, they got Juan Soto, who of course they traded to the Yankees this year. Um, is this, and they've lost money last year and the year before. So um, is is this a sustainable thing? If they can keep this going, do they kind of reach another level of uh, being able to you know sustain higher revenues and higher payrolls? If they can keep what going, losing money, or if they, if they can, can keep the <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah, the attendance, the high. So you know, here's my attendance. question: We don't look. It's funny. Attendance is PR, which is why I would make it up every game. I, I literally would make up the attendance because we didn't want to finish last and we would we would just buy dollar tickets and count them in paid attendance. You really have to look at ticket revenue. That is the metric that's used. You can, If you have 3 million people at a dollar, you have 3 million in ticket revenue, not so good. If you have 3 million people at an average ticket price of $100, all of a sudden you're the number one team in baseball. So it really does depend on what the average ticket price is when you look at attendance because you're really looking at total revenue. But the reality is that San Diego has a problem. They are in violation of the debt service rule in Major League Baseball. They're a team that's losing money, which means by definition, you're not allowed really a lot of debt. There's a rule about the amount of debt you can have based on your EBITDA. And the Padres have negative EBITDA. They're losing money on an operating basis and on an accounting basis. But what Peter Seidler, rest in peace, was trying to do was trying to buy himself into a different size market. And we've seen owners try to do that before. And no matter how successful you are, no matter how much winning you do, no matter who you sign, you can never run away or change from the market that you are. And San Diego is not LA. It'll never be LA. They have a thing for LA where they so badly want to be LA, but they won't be. This The television revenue will never be the same. The gate revenue will never be the same. The sponsorship revenue will never be the same. Therefore, when you talk about sustainability, why do you think AJ Preller, he, he trades for Soto, gets hater, then they go. He's traded players and got rid of players almost at the rate we did in Florida. And so the question is, what bounce can you get from a successful playoff run? And that we haven't seen yet with the Padres. So if they can get it together this year and let's say win the pennant, what does that mean for ticket prices next year or expiring corporate sales deals that they can renew? What will it mean trying to cobble together their local TV revenue? Then you can start talking about making more money, but the fact is their payroll is just too high. Just to back up for a sec. So with the Marlins, you would buy up tickets from yourself and say, you know, we got an extra whatever 5,000 people to show up today. And that was just like a regular thing. So you have to. So the way it works is that attendance that's announced is paid attendance. It's not turnstile. And so you can look at no-show rates. We would always have a 70% no-show rate because in the sixth inning, I would buy 10,000 tickets, let's say, at a dollar. That means you're putting $10,000 into your financials because you're audited, number one. Number two, there's revenue sharing. So we were revenue sharing recipient, but we still had revenue and expenses. And the funny part is when we would buy 10,000 tickets for a dollar, we would show $10,000 of ticket revenue, but there's also $10,000 of expense because we viewed that as an operating expense. And the reason why we did that is we didn't want to be embarrassed with our attendance, but you couldn't just make up a number. You had to actually have tickets sold for that number. So I'm just sort of bringing you inside mechanically how we do it. And how common is that in MLB? <laughs> 
I didn't make it up. I can tell you that. Uh, I'm not exactly a trailblazer, though I guess maybe selling tickets the way uh, the Marlins did to the Otani game. I don't know if you saw that. That was great. After the Otani 50-50 game, you could go to the box office and buy tickets as though you were there for 25 bucks to pretend you're there. And I did that when Roy Halladay threw a perfect game against us. We sold tickets after the fact, and then we announced the attendance for that game as an increased number because those were actually sold tickets for that game. So everyone's doing something with attendance. Bud Selig was very into attendance and records and everything like that. Rob is not as obsessed with it, but of course it's good PR when you can send out a release that industry attendance is up 2.2% or whatever numbers they use, but you can really play with those numbers a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we you see like, you know, fan panoramas of say, like, you know, announced attendance like 12,000 and there's like, you know, 1,200 people there. That's, that's, uh, that's page two of the playbook. David Sampson, great to have you back on. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. The sale of the Boston Celtics is unlikely to be completed before 2025. At Celtics Media Day, pre team president Brad Stevens suggested the sale was still in its early stages, saying he, quote, does not think the sale process will affect the day-to-day -day operations of the team as it chases another title. Each year we'll have to assess how everything looks, and certainly the new ownership group will dictate a lot of that. Ownership is looking to sell the team after its first championship in 16 years due to a reported financial dispute between father and son Irving and Wick Grossbeck. The Celtics have made eye-watering financial commitments to its current team with a combined payroll and luxury tax of $513 million for the 2025-26 season alone. This is one of the most desirable teams in the NBA to own, but no part of it is going to be cheap. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, drop us a rating or review and share this episode with a friend. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.